Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, guys. Welcome to Harbor Covenant Church. Welcome to Harbor Covenant Church. My name is Allison. I'm Audrey. This is my mom, Romina, and this is my dad, Danny. We are the, we are the Yager, Yager family. family. We are Dan and Sherry Wright. And we are so happy that you're joining us for worship today. Definitely. It might look a little different. It might look a little different. But church ain't a building. But church ain't a building. But church ain't a building. Church is not a building. No, no, no. And we're always so blessed when we can worship Jesus together. 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 shall be your supply the flame shall not hurt you i only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine great to be here together, and we are together, even though if we don't feel that way. And uh, I know that maybe you're in a place where you're feeling alone, and I, I totally get that. It's a natural thing to be feeling right now, but I want you to hear these words from Isaiah in chapter 41. It says this, starting in verse 8, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. I took you from the ends of the earth. From its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. This is verse 10, says this. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God, I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Sing of his relentless love. Salvation sounds a new beginning It's distant 
hearts begin believing. Redemption's big. verse in Isaiah 41 verse 10 that said not to fear for God is with us and this next song is just a reminder a constant reminder of whatever we're, you're going through no matter how alone you're feeling whatever we're going through God is with us so let's keep that in mind as we continue worshiping together Another died for me. There is a 
Join me in prayer. God, we give you thanks this morning for the opportunity to gather online as a church. And God, for those in Gig Harbor as well as all over this country, God, we pray this morning that we would, uh, we would worship you and be challenged by your word uh, and be encouraged in our faith. Uh, God, uh, at the forefront of our mind right now is, uh, is the COVID virus. And we, God, we pray for those that are infected 
Uh, God, we pray for health care workers uh, that are uh, overworked and exhausted. Um, God, give them strength. God, bring healing to those that are sick. Uh, God, for those that have lost loved ones, God, give them comfort and give them peace. God, we also want to pray for those that, uh, that live in poverty, that don't have access to medical care. God, that many uh, now are going through uh, times of uh, starvation and um, insecurity around food. God, we pray that, uh, that their needs would be met, uh, that uh, local communities would look out for those uh, that are suffering, and that your church would rise up and be your hands and feet in the community. God, for everyone who uh, is going through a time of loss, loved ones and family, uh, God, some, some people have lost jobs, income and savings, uh, are just missing out on relationships and connections with others as they feel isolated and alone. Uh, God, give us your presence and give us your peace. God, as we continue to move forward as a church on mission, God, uh, give us an imagination and creativity uh, to reach those that are far from you. God, continue to use our online networks to be able to uh, reach out in relationship with others and to build each other up and encourage each other. And now let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Lashana Haba'a Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. It's how every Seder ends. And the Jewish people long that the next time they do this, they'll be together in Jerusalem. That's how I feel every week when I come here. I'm like, next week, maybe we'll be together. It's been a long time. It feels like the longest month of my life. Um, and I look forward to the next time that we're together, whenever that will be. So grateful for the technology that allows us to connect at this level, to be in our homes, but to know that we're all worshiping at the same time. And love seeing some of you during the week on Zoom or whatever. And I know many of you are connecting. Some of you, you have watched the children's programming, the JAR stuff. Some of you are watching the student ministries thing. This might even be your third hour of the day. And it's just great to be able to have those things to make the connection. Uh, but still, we miss being together. So I am look forward, looking forward to the next time we'll be together. Uh, this last October, when Rachel, my oldest daughter, came home for a break, we decided that we'd plant some tulips. So I ordered some from a farm up in the Skagit Valley, and one day we dug up places in the backyard, and you can see the picture of us looking like American Gothic and planting our tulips, and then just kind of forgot about them. And towards the end of January, started to see little green growths coming up. And I'm like, that seems a little early for tulips. And in fact, it was. They were daffodils that I hadn't realized I had planted. And so the daffodils came up, and then pretty soon the tulips came up. And here's a couple of pictures of the tulips in my backyard, too. And we are enjoying those so much. I mean, they are massive, and they are colorful, and they are beautiful. And they've been up for like, I don't know, about a month. And from where we sit in our dining room, we can look out. And I am so enjoying the fact that we've got these beautiful tulips out there. But what I'm starting to notice is that the ones that came up first are now sort of fading away. They don't open and close anymore, they just sort of fade. And little by little, I realize that they're past their prime. The daffodils are completely gone now, and the tulips are going that way. And I will miss them because they're absolutely beautiful. But it's sort of an object lesson for me, and it's helping me think about the scripture that we're going to talk about today. Because as beautiful as the tulips are, as much as I have anticipated them, they don't last forever. Their beauty is fading. And lots of things are like tulips. Nothing lasts forever. Everything lasts for a little while, and then it fades away or dies. 
And what I find myself longing for, this would be a lifelong longing, but it's also a longing during this whole COVID-19 pandemic, is I'm longing for something permanent. I'm longing for something that doesn't change. I just think about all the things that change or that have changed. I mean, in general times, I can remember when eggs were good for you. And then there was another scientific study that said eggs were bad for you. And then I remember when salt was bad for you, and then salt was good for you. And then coffee was good for you, and then coffee was bad for you. And then wine was bad for you, only nobody cared they drank it anyway. Um, but it just it seems like there's, you know, this seems good, but then it's this. And there's just so many things that change. And now during these coronavirus times, I mean, one of our highest goals as Americans has been that we want to do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it. We think that's good. Total personal freedom. Only now when we realize how other people's actions might affect us, we really look at that differently now, don't we? We don't look at that the same. I remember towards the beginning of this, they said that you were only contagious when you had symptoms. And now we've learned that you can be asymptomatic and be contagious. For the longest time, people told us we don't need to wear masks. And now we're supposed to wear masks every time we go out. For the longest time, it only affected older people. And now we're realizing it can kill anyone. And then in the midst of this, on social media and on the news, whatever channel you listen to, there's all of these opinions swirling around, the vast majority of them completely uninformed, and yet being spewed out and flying around at warp speed. And I'm looking for something that's permanent. I'm looking for something that doesn't change. I want to know something that I can trust is true because it was true yesterday, it'll be true today, and it will be true tomorrow. And so my tulips and my desire to find something that doesn't change reminded me of one of my favorite verses out of one of my favorite chapters. Uh, In the prophet Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8, the prophet writes these words, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. That is what I'm looking for something that lasts for forever. Doesn't wither, doesn't fade, but lasts. So we're in the second week in this sermon series where we're asking, how then shall we live? Because we're looking at our response to living in coronavirus times, but also in the reality of Easter and the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead and what that means for our lives. And I said last week that I believe that this is one of those times that provides clarity in our lives. We're realizing that some things are important and some things aren't as important as we might have once thought they are now that we have the clarity of Easter and the coronavirus. And I'm learning that one of the big rocks that we have to put in the container is God's Word. I'm learning the importance of God's Word. And in this time, I'm becoming more and more aware that we can fill our minds with all sorts of stuff. We can fill our minds with the 24-hour news cycle. We can fill our minds with uh, social media. We can fill our minds with all, every manner of pornography that's out there. There's all kinds of stuff that we can fill our minds with. But only some of it is going to be good. And only some of it will affect us positively. And only some of it will last forever. And so I want to take a look at Isaiah 40 and why God's Word is one of the big rocks that has to be in uh, the container of our lives because it's so important as we move forward. So I'm going to read some, some scripture that's very familiar, only not in this context. From Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for, that she's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged place is a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. That's a Christmas verse. And maybe that's jogging your memory like, oh, I know I've heard that. 
But it goes on. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because of the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. The context of God's word enduring forever is a verse that we think about in Advent, preparing for Christmas. Uh, Isaiah the prophet is looking at events that are actually going to happen a hundred years after he dies. He's looking forward to the Babylonian captivity, which begins in about 597 BC. So Isaiah is prophesying, you know, 700 BC and before that, and looking down through the midst of time at this time when the people of Israel are going to be taken captive to Babylon, which is how it got its name, the Babylonian captivity. Babylon is, I don't know, 800 miles from Jerusalem, where they lived, 800 miles on foot walking, being dragged 800 miles to be in exile, where many of the people were in exile for 75 years until the Babylonian Empire was actually taken over by the Persian Empire, and they began to let the people go home. And so much of the rich tradition of the Old Testament comes out of the Babylonian captivity because the people ask the question, where is God in all of this? If we're God's people, why are bad things happening to us? And maybe you've asked those questions because it's common. I mean, we're God's people. Why are we in a situation like this? Why have we feel like we've been uprooted from our lives? I certainly feel like I've been uprooted from, from my life that I was living. It's not as harsh as having to be you know, captured and moving to Babylon, but I, I understand that. And so the people's question was, where is God? And it's into that questioning, it's into them living in exile and wondering where God was in all of this chaos. It's into that that Isaiah speaks these words to people that are not necessarily in bondage, but they are far from home. They are far from their normal lives. They're foreigners in a foreign land and they long to be home again, much the same way that many of us long to be in our regular lives. And God's word to them in the midst of their pain and their suffering and their anxiety and their questioning is comfort. Comfort my people, speak tenderly to them, Proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, her sin has been paid for. In other words, God begins to speak words of restoration. God begins to speak words to remind them that they have hope and that God is going to bring them back again. And then you have this, this uh, portion that we associate, gets picked up and, and associated with John the Baptist much later, because many of these prophecies, you know, are, are good for several different times. The, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The valley will be raised up, the mountains will be made low, the rough ground will become level, the rugged places a plain. It's this image of God bringing his people back. Not God being far from his people saying, y'all come back, but God actually being in exile with them and leading them back to their home, leading them back to the place that they will be at, that they should be at. And it says, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. The glory is the presence of God with his people and all people will see it together. And then there is this line, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. God has given his word that this will happen. And then that gets picked up again in verse 8 where it says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. It's looking back to the promise of God. The mouth of the Lord has spoken comfort. The mouth of the Lord has spoken tenderness. tenderness. The mouth of the Lord has proclaimed that we will be brought back from our exile and that he will lead us to the place that he is calling us to be. And the word of the Lord is not like the grass, it's not like my tulips, because it will endure forever. God is coming to be with his people. God is coming to restore his people. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The word of God endures forever. 
And this happens in three different ways within this text. It's talking about the immediacy, a hundred years later, of the return from exile, from, from the Babylonian exile, that God will bring his people back from the exile in Babylon. It's looking forward to Jesus and John the Baptist because Jesus brings us out of the exile of our sin and being separated from God and being separated from one another. Our God will come to us and lead us out of the exile. He does this in Jesus and it looks forward to the end of time when the new heaven and the new earth come and for one last time God comes to dwell with his people and rescues us from the bondage to sin and death and slavery and the principalities and the powers and God will be our God and we will be his people forever and we can stand on this we can trust this because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it and the word of God endures forever this is true these are the things we need to know these are the things we need to cling to these are the things that will not change and it's one of the reasons why the Bible is so important, because it is so much more than a rule book. It's the story of the purposes of God. And Isaiah 40 encapsulates those purposes. God wants to be with us. God wants to be with us in our exile. And God wants to bring us home. And that's why the Bible has such an important rule, uh, place in the church, an important role within the church, because the Bible reminds us that God speaks. We may not always feel like God is talking, but the very fact that God has given us his word is to remind us that he is a communicative God. He speaks, he listens, he enters into conversation, he talks to us. And it explains the story of God's purpose. It's not just to transfer information. It's not just a collection of moral examples or dogmatic teaching. It's the story of the reminder of how much God loves us. It's the story of who we are in God's eyes and who God is. It reminds us that God speaks. It explains the story of God's purpose and it calls us to action in response to that. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2 that our minds can be transformed if we don't conform to the world, but if we conform to God, we will be changed. We can think, we can act in new ways. It calls us to action to be changed. It calls us to action like in the Great Commission, uh, to go into all the world and preach the gospel and the Great Commandment, to love God and to love each other. We are called to action because of the truth of the story that our God is among us and our God is calling us to him. So in this time when we have these moments to figure out what is most important, in these moments of COVID-19 clarity when we can pause, if we want to be formed by things that are eternal, that last, how are you exposed to the Bible? In what ways are you connected to it? Because this is a time to form new habits. This is a time to change the way we think and the way we act. This is the time to change what we believe about ourselves and what we believe about others. This is the time to see ourselves as God sees us and not through the distorted lens of our culture. So if the Bible is true, if the Bible, if the word of God endures forever, if the Bible is the story of life change for you and a God who loves you, who wants to lead you out of your exile, how are you connected with it? And truth be told, we're not all spending our time very well. We choose to do things maybe just to pass the time. I remember in, um, I was probably in high school and I went to summer camp with my church and I heard a speaker talking about what we were putting into our minds. And probably a lot of people have used this phrase, but it's the first time that I heard it and it has always rang true for me. And he said, you put garbage in, you get garbage out. If you're filling your mind with things that are trash, that's what you're going to get in. That's what you're going to get out. Think of some of the garbage that we believe. You're the center of the universe. No one else matter. Your personal happiness is the most important thing every minute of every day. Young people are important. Old people are not. Wealthy people have value. 
Poor people are expendable. People who are experiencing homeless or don't have work should buck up and get a job. The lighter your skin, the better. Women aren't as valuable as men. You're only as good as what you produce. Porn doesn't hurt anybody. You don't need to keep your promises. You only need to do what you want to do. That's all garbage. And yet that's what we live in. That's what we put into our minds so much every day. And if that's the garbage we're putting out, that's the, the garbage we're putting in, that's the garbage that we will live in that will come out of us. Instead of that garbage, if you want to know that you have worth and value irrespective of what you do, if you want to know that things are not spinning out of control, that there actually is a God who is in control of all of this, if you want to know that there is meaning in the world even now and that your life can have significance even now, if you want to know if you can find peace and hope in life even in the midst of the corona pandemic, if you want to know that God's love for you will never change, if you want to know that if you run out of strength that there is a source of strength for you, if you want to know that, then you've got to engage with the Bible because that's the truth that the Bible is going to tell you. And that's why the Bible is so important to us. And that's why we need to be taking this time to engage in a deeper level with the Bible. Uh, the Covenant Church has always been incredibly Bible-based. In fact, we don't have a set creed or statement uh, of beliefs. We pretty much say we believe in the Bible. And what we would say is that we believe that the Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments, are the Word of God, the authoritative Word of God. And that everything that we need to know for faith, doctrine, and conduct is in there. In other words, the Bible tells us how we can know God. The, the Bible tells us what to believe about God and what about us. I, I'm not talking necessarily that God exists, but that about who God is, about his character, about his love for us, about the fact that God loves us so much that he goes to the nth degree to buy us back because he finds us so worthy. It tells us what to believe about God, tells us about what to believe about us, and it tells us how we need to live our lives in response to that love. It tells us how our lives should be ordered so that we can be significant. It tells us what we need to do and what we need to think and how we need to act so that we can be a part of God's plan to bring hope and healing to everyone else around the world. That's why the Bible is so important because of the way that it in, engages us. And so we want to engage uh, with the Bible because it will transform our mind. It will change our thoughts. It will renew our character. It'll change how we pray and what we pray for. In, in fact, let me do a, a brief little um, heads up about this. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks on our podcast platform, and hopefully you've been looking at that, is we're going to produce prayer walks. Um, I've noticed lots of people are out getting their 10,000 steps in a day or whatever. I'm out running and I see people on the Cushman Trail. I see people downtown and you know, people walking around my neighborhood, certainly. And so I presume that you're doing that too. And so what we're going to do is we're going to produce 20-minute podcasts that will all be about prayer. There'll be music, there'll be prayer prompts, there'll be time for med meditation, and just an opportunity for you to pray as you are out exercising and being around. The Bible teaches us how to pray. The Bible changes how we pray. It changes how we deal with others. It helps us to know how we should be characterized by love. So that's why we want to engage it. So how do you engage it? And one of the first things that you gotta get over is, I think in many ways the Bible gets a bad rap because people think it's boring. And certainly there are parts of it that are more challenging than others. Uh, but there are two things that I think that you can do to help you get over that. One is don't read it in the King James Version. I know there's three of you that just decided to leave the church because you think if it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for you. But it is very, very difficult to read 17th century English. So, so get a different translation that speaks like you do, and that will help out a lot. Just get a good Bible. Or go to the Bible app on uh, Life Church TV. Uh, it's on there. And pick whatever. I mean, you can read through four or five different types. Um, look at the message. Look at the NIV. 
look at the Common English Version uh, and just find one that you can read. That's the biggest, you know, it, it's like if you were going to pick up Chaucer's Beowulf and read it, you know, in Old English, it would be harder than it needs to be. So find a translation that you can read. And then start easy. I mean, I would not recommend starting with Leviticus or Numbers. I just wouldn't. Um, I, I, here's a, here's a, a, a recommendation that might surprise you. Read the book of Esther. Esther is a really cool book. It has history, it has intrigue, it has a villain, it has a heroine. I mean, it is a great story. Everything you want to know about royal court intrigue and how God works in people. Read the book of Esther, it's a great start. Um, read the book of John, the Gospel of John, and hear how John talks about Jesus. Start easy. Be realistic. You probably will not sit down and read all 150 Psalms in one setting. You probably will not sit down and read all of the, all of the chapters of Isaiah. Start out with chunks. Now, I'm a big believer in reading more than one or two verses because I think that teaches us to pull things out of context. And I think context is everything when it comes to Bible reading. So at least read a chapter. Read, I mean, start with a chapter a day with uh, the Gospel of John, or you, know, you could actually read Esther in one sitting. But be realistic about what you can do. Um, as you begin to read the Bible, as you engage with it, be very wary of radical new insights. I know you're smart, but the chances that you are the only one in 3,000 years in Bible reading who saw this one thing is pretty slim which is why it's always re better to read with somebody else. And that can be a Bible study group, that can be a buddy that you're discussing this on your socially distanced walking or on Zoom or whatever. It can be a commentary, it can be a daily devotional. So read, read something like that. You might want to read with purpose. Um, I challenged people to read the Gospel of Matthew so that it would inform how you voted next November. Read with purpose. Maybe read with the purpose of discovering why we have hope in Jesus. Maybe read with purpose about how we can have peace in difficult times. Maybe you could read with the purpose of how do you become a better dad? It's all in there. And if you want some ideas about how you can read for those purposes, let me know. And also read for application. As you go through your chapter, as you read through the book of Esther, ask, how does this apply to me? What does this say to me? And then ask, what do I need to do? Now, there's also some dangers in reading the Bible because sometimes we make the Bible smaller than it is. The Bible is more than just your personal devotional book. The Bible is about the global work of God. And so we need to see the global implications of what we're reading, not just, you know, how it affects me. It's a danger if we never put the Bible into context, the context that it was written or to the context of our own lives. It's a danger if we don't ask the question, how does this relate in a new, fresh way to me today? The Bible can be dangerous because we choose to ignore parts of it. Well, what we need to do when we come to the Bible is bring ourselves to it, not it to ourselves. And there will be challenging ideas. There will be things that make you think differently. But we have to wrestle with the entire text, not just parts of it. And the corollary to that is when we defend that the Bible is the absolute true word of God, but we don't put it into use in our lives. It's like we believe that it's objectively true, but subjectively, it doesn't seem to make any difference for us. Uh, there's this verse in Psalm 119 that says, your word have I hid in my heart. And I know plenty of people who have hid God's word in their heart. They know an awful lot about God's word, but they've missed the second part of the verse. Your word have I hid in my heart, so I might not sin against you. The idea is that we hide God's word in our heart. We come into contact with the Bible so that we'll be changed, so that we'll be new people. And I know far too many people who've gotten the first part. They hid God's word and it has nowhere affected 
their lives. They're still just as mean and joyless as they ever were before. And that can be a danger. We read the Bible for personal transformation. We study the Bible sometimes, but to what end? It's not just so that we continually soak it up. It's so that we can be changed by it. The Bible is one of the big rocks that needs to be put into our lives. It's one of the habits exposing yourself to that that we need to be developing during this time when we have clarity because the Bible is going to be eternally true. It's going to tell you what to believe about yourself, about God, and it'll help you navigate these waters. So I have three questions for you. The first is, if you're honest, what source of information is the greatest influence on your life? The second is, what's your biggest growth area? I mean, are you really wrestling with faith? Are you wrestling with joy? Are you wrestling with peace? Are you wrestling with trying to cope with all of this? What's the area that you want to grow in? Because you can bring that to the Bible. And the third is, what steps can you take to find out what the Bible has to say about that growth area? That's your action point. If you want to grow in peace, how can you figure out what the Bible has to say about peace?
Hey, if you're new with us this morning, we're really glad that you joined us. If you can fill out the, the Connect tab up in the right-hand corner, we'll send you a small gift in the mail, as well as donate $5 to a local food bank to help out with the crisis that's happening locally. If you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook and you missed our 8.30 and 10 o'clock Sunday morning gathering, we'd love for you to join us this next Sunday at harborcove.online.church. And if you fill out that Connect tab, we'll send you a gift in the mail as well, as well as donate $5 to a local food bank. Harbor Covenant Church, thank you so much for being a generous giving family. It's amazing how much ministry you facilitate by your generous gifts. Receive the benediction. People of God, may the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy in believing that you might abound in hope according to the power of the Holy Spirit, all through the love of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.